everyone. Um, I want to get started a little bit early because I want to make sure that I don't cut into any of the time uh, for Aldo here because I'm really looking forward to this talk. Uh, so I just want to go ahead and as behalf of the Password Con staff and B-Sides, welcome everyone here to Vegas. You know, this is a really cool thing to be doing this again here, okay? Um, so uh, just to take the, the, the energy down a notch here, I just have a few announcements just to, to, to you know, start off things here. Uh, so first of all, um, I guess we're contractually, uh, you know, uh, I really want to thank our sponsors because we wouldn't have this here, you know, uh, if it wasn't for them. So thank you, Adobe, you're, you know, our gold, our, our diamond sponsor here, as well as Toyota, uh, SEMGREP, and Blue Cat. Uh, so thank you, we really appreciate this. I love doing this here, you make this possible. So I really appreciate this a lot. Also, for cell phones, uh, these talks are being streamed on live uh, here, so please, you know, uh, don't have any side conversations on your cell phones or something like that there. You know, this is a passwords contract, so I'm sure we can go ahead and figure some way to be able to deal with that if it happens here. Uh, so, also, kind of really, real quick here, you know, We've been doing passwords con for a long time. You know, haven't we solved this problem or something like that there? Um, and the answer is obviously no. But uh, once again, I just kind of want to, you know, get a little bit of an audience Q and A uh, start thing started off here. But who here has had their password stolen? <laughs> I certainly have. Yeah. You know, I've, I've almost getting bored of this now. You know, it's like, oh, my password got stolen again. I guess it's a Tuesday. Um, so let me go ahead and tell you probably the, the worst data breach I've ever been a part of. So when I first graduated college, I loaded up literally everything I own into my uh, car, and I was going, you know, job searching and stuff like that. And one day I woke up, you know, came down from my hotel room, and the back window of my car was broken, and I found out I owned significantly less stuff. So like some of it was really kind of annoying. Like I had disassembled all my furniture, so they stole the bag of all the bolts, which is just mean. Um, but, you know, they also stole all of my important documents because I had left them in my car. So they got my birth certificate, they got my social security card, they got my passport, they got blank checks. Like, literally, if you can think of something that's physical uh, that you don't want to get stolen, that got stolen from me. So, you know, I might not actually be, you know, Matt Weir, I might not be, you know, the, I might be the person who broke into the car as far as you know. Um, but, you know, I was able to recover from that. I was able to go ahead and get new credit cards. I was able to get new checks. I was able to get new IDs. And I think that really speaks to kind of the resiliency of this authentication, of the fact that I can suffer the worst possible breach that you can even imagine. And I was able to still be able to recover from that. And that's where I think, you know, passwords are really a big part role of this too, because we have so many different problems with passwords. You know, we get them stolen all the time. And yet we can still book plane tickets. We can still show up at Vegas. We can still, you know, have the hotel, you know, uh, accept our credit cards. And I think that really speaks to, you know, the value of all the hard work that everyone here has been putting into this type of field. So, you know, an obvious question though is, you know, why are we still using passwords? They get stolen all the time. They, you know, can't we move to more of a password list type of an option here? And that's why I'm really excited to go ahead and introduce Aldo here, uh, because he's going to tell us about some of the challenges that occur when we go ahead and move to this as, here as well. So can we all go ahead and give a hands here to Aldo? All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Uh, well, my name is Aldo, and uh, I'm here today to talk about passwordless and uh, passwordless security. Uh, so it's actually an honor to be here in PasswordsCon, and you know, uh, I was a little bit nervous to be the first one to be speaking today, uh, but actually, uh, quite the opposite because that actually takes the pressure off. Because if this talk sucks, uh, then the bar is going to be so low for everybody else. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> If, I, if anybody here is a speaker, uh, you're welcome. So let's let's try to make this talk uh, suck a lot for the for all of you. All right. So <laughs> so uh, yeah, who am I? Right. So I've been doing AppSec for about 15 years, a little bit more. Uh, you know, from doing pen tests to code review to everything in between. I am also uh, an OWASP chapter leader in my city, and right now I am running the application security program for Hyper, which it is a password startup. Uh, it's kind of ironic that I'm talking about passwordless vulnerabilities, but it's going to make sense, trust me. Uh, so before I begin, uh, can you just let me know how many people here are uh, developers? All right. Uh, what about pen testers? Nice. And is anybody here already using passwordless, either at work or in your personal devices? Awesome. Cool. Thank you. All right. So let's get started. So uh, let's begin by answering this question. Uh, does anybody here? think that using uh, a password solution is actually worse or is actually less secure than having a password? Can anybody think that? Right? 
a few of you. All right. Well, the answer to that question, uh, actually, no, is not uh, less secure. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Uh, and, yeah, well, and actually, that is, that is my whole talk. Uh, thanks for coming here today. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, that was a terrible joke. I'm sorry about that. Uh, now, this is the agenda that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, first of all, some uh, background on why am I giving this talk. Uh, what is passwordless for those of you who are not familiar with this paradigm? And then we're going to deep uh, dive into what are the actual issues with passwordless implementations. And at the end, we're going to have some recommendations for all of you, uh, developers, pen testers, and enterprises. Uh, so to set up the expectations, uh, this talk is about, uh, you know, this is a brief introduction into passwordless. Uh, this is not a full talk on passwordless. Uh, we're going to be talking about vulnerabilities in a passwordless implementation, uh, specifically a web application. Uh, you know, passwordless can be used in other types of applications, but these vulnerabilities are related to passwordless in web applications. Uh, and these, pro these issues were identified in a particular passwordless product. Uh, that shall remain nameless, uh, but <laughs> no, it's actually my employer. So, uh, <laughs> so, but these vulnerabilities apply to any application that is using uh, passwordless. So, uh, this is not specific to a product; it applies to any application that is using passwordless. So, what this talk is not about, uh, we're not going to be disclosing any new attacks. I'm not dropping any old days today. Uh, I'm not doing a new, a full talk on passwordless here. Uh, we're not going to be talking about how to break cryptography. Uh, you know, passwordless, one of the implementations uses uh, public key cryptography, so we're not going to be talking about that today. And um, yeah, why am I doing this today, right? So basically, uh, I think that nobody's talking about passwordless vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, the vendors right now in the whole industry is moving away from passwords slowly, but it's moving away from passwords to the uh, passwordless paradigm. But uh, nobody's actually talking about it. And you know, uh, a lot of big players such as Microsoft, Google, Apple, they all are pushing for passwordless, but they are not talking about their, their issues, right? Uh, I actually went to boldb.com and searched for passwordless, and I get zero results. None. None of it. Uh, some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about today is already public, and they are not there. Uh, out of curiosity, not to throw shade to any of the competitors, but I went ahead and I went to their websites looking for some advisory page, some something related to vulnerabilities, and I didn't find anything. So in, in short, uh, nobody's talking about this. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, when I was getting ready for this talk, I went ahead and looked for uh, passkeys on Google. And as you can see here, uh, we have many examples of companies already implementing passwords. We have, well, they are implementing passkeys, which is uh, a way of doing passwordless. And we're going to be talking about that. So uh, we have one password. We have TikTok that is now using passkeys. We have GitHub. We have PayPal. We have Apple ID. And this was just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, if you go right now and search for passkeys, you're probably going to find more examples like this. So a lot of companies are going passwordless. And uh, but how secure are they? That is the question. So what is passwordless? For those of you who are not familiar with this paradigm, and paradigm or are not really sure what I'm talking about, passwordless essentially means uh, not using a password. In short, that's, that's, it, that's, that's it, basically. Uh, and no, that's really not a joke. That is actually what it means. Uh, one of the most traditional implementations uh, is using public key cryptography, but there are more. Uh, and essentially, well, if you are not familiar with public key cryptography, essentially it creates uh, a key pair, one public key and one private key. The public key stays in the server, the private key stays with you or your device, and then uh, the application sends a challenge that you have to sign with your private key, and only you can uh, sign that challenge. It's very secure. Uh, a lot of cryptography works that way nowadays, so uh, this is how uh, the most common ways of implementing passwordless nowadays. Uh, a couple of quick mentions. Uh, when you are using a password manager, that is not passwordless. And I mentioned this because I saw a post uh, the other day about somebody telling, oh, go passwordless, use a password manager. And uh, <laughs> that is obviously not passwordless. They are just, well, you're storing your password somewhere else. So that is not passwordless. When you have two-factor authentication, that is also not passwordless because uh, you are providing your username and password, and then you are providing an additional factor. Uh, and lastly, when you have one-time password, where obviously the name suggests you have a password that is valid only once, but it's still a password. So uh, in short, passwordless means using no passwords. And uh, 
these are some of the ways that you can actually implement passwordless. Uh, let's let's talk about them real quick. Uh, one of the simplest ways to implement passwordless is using a magic link. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with magic links, essentially a website sends you a link to your email. You click it and you authenticate to that website. That's it. And uh, I think that's why it's called Magic Link, because it looks like magic. You don't have to provide a username. You don't have to provide a password. You simply click on a link, and you're in. Uh, that is actually pretty practical, but uh, it has some disadvantages, such as if the attacker knows your, uh, well, if the attacker has access to your email, well, they own your accounts, right? Uh, these Magic Links can be delivered using email, SMS, and basically uh, any way that you can reach your user. The second part of the... Uh, way to implement uh, passwordless is using security keys, uh, such as these ones. So these are YubiKeys. These are physical security keys. Uh, anybody here already uses YubiKeys or security keys? Oh, perfect. Oh, that's amazing. So the, uh, this is actually my preferred way to implement passwordless. Uh, but as you know, this, is, this could be quite expensive, especially if you are a big uh, company. Uh, for instance, let's say that you are Facebook and you want to deploy passwordless to all of your users. Uh, I don't know how many users they have, probably a billion, I don't know. So can you imagine just trying to purchase YubiKeys for your million users? Uh, that's not going to scale. And lastly, we have biometrics, which uh, work in the same way, uh, well, very similar to security keys. They create a public key pair and you have your own uh, private key and that is unlocked using your biometrics. So this is a very good alternative to uh, security keys. Uh, everybody has a smartphone nowadays, and they can use that smartphone as a way to provide passwordless access using your biometrics. This is just an example of how Slack uh, does passwordless. Essentially, you go to the login, you provide your email, and they are going to send you an email, an email with a code, and you provide that code, and you don't have to provide any passwords at all. That is another way to implement passwordless. All right, but now we have FIDO. I mean, uh, we, we see that we have several ways to implement passwordless, but we really didn't have a standard uh, until recently. So uh, everybody was doing it uh, on their own way. So this is why the FIDO Alliance, FIDO Alliance exists. The FIDO Alliance basically is an organization that uh, is in charge of maintaining a specification for the FIDO protocol. Uh, FIDO means Fast Identity Online. So essentially, it has two main components. Uh, one of them is Web Authent, which is uh, short for web authentication. It's a set of APIs that browsers can use to communicate between uh, these authenticators and web applications. And the other component is the client to authentication protocol, which we're not going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to be talking heavily about Web Authent today. So uh, again, this is a set of APIs that the browser uses to communicate between uh, the authenticators, which can be uh, security keys or fingerprint, and web applications. Also, uh, I wanted to mention passkeys. Uh, when I say passkeys, when I say security keys, when I say uh, passwordless, and I, when I say biometrics, I am referring to the same thing. Uh, they are not the same thing. I am simplifying things. But for the purposes of this talk, uh, it's all the same. And uh, all these vulnerabilities are going to apply to passkeys, security keys, uh, biometrics, and any other authenticator. And just to double down on web button, again, uh, this is a set of APIs, JavaScript APIs, that allow your browser to communicate with authenticators and um, web application or relying party. Authenticators can be anything such as a physical security key, uh, Touch ID on your Mac, Windows Hello on your Windows computer, and biometrics on your mobile devices. Uh, so this is an example of uh, what using Web Authent looks like. Uh, on the left, you have a YubiKey. Uh, in the middle, you have fingerprint in Chrome. And lastly, a fingerprint in, uh, on an iPhone. So if you previously have seen something like this, uh, you are already using, pa well, not passwordless, but Web Authent. All right, so why, why go in passwordless? Uh, I found this fine gentleman online, which uh, probably hates passwords as much as we do. Uh, so, well, we are a password cons, right? Uh, Probably a lot of you know that everything about passwords suck. So, uh, you know, storing them, protecting them, hashing them. Uh, yeah, you, you have to use an algorithm that is slow enough to stop attackers, but not slow enough to bother users. Uh, well, it, it, is a, it is a problem, right? 
when you go passwordless, you don't have any more passwords to remember, you don't have any more passwords to protect. Uh, you don't have to worry about ineffective complexity factors. And f you don't have to worry about people don't knowing their own passwords. Uh, you know, the last time that I got my wife a phone, I was helping her trying to set up her phone, right? And I asked her, hey, can you log into your Gmail account so we can set up your phone? And she was like, uh, I don't know my password. I'm like, what do you mean you don't know your password? And, and she doesn't. Uh, you know, she logged into the Gmail account once and she forgot about it. And the same thing happened with my parents. When I got them new phones, they didn't know their passwords. So, uh, well, they were all able to reset them. But I mean, this is an issue. Nobody, well, a lot of people don't know their own passwords. Uh, passwordless is traditional, then uh, it's faster than traditional MFA. Uh, it protects against phishing. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this, essentially when you register a security key, that security key is registered to a specific uh, website. So if somebody was trying to phish me and they send me a fake link for my Microsoft account, even if I were able to uh, fall for that trick and I plug in my YubiKey, it's not gonna work because that security key or that FIDO credential is only linked to a specific website. So uh, that is not gonna work. And lastly, we don't have any more password resets, we don't have any dictionary attacks, et cetera, et cetera. So all good things when not using passwords. So, ah, thanks, thanks for uh, going through that. Uh, I needed to provide you some background for those of you who were not familiar with passwordless. Now let's talk about this. So passwordless has a few misconceptions. Uh, like we just saw a lot of people may think that passwordless is less secure. Um, basically, you don't have a password, right? So what is protecting my account if I don't have a password? Uh, no password means no security? Uh, that is not the case. Uh, we're gonna see it. And uh, for instance, we also, I have heard from people who think that somebody else can unlock their phone using uh, a photo or maybe their twin for, for people who have twins. Uh, and also people thinking that fingerprint can be cloned. Uh, those are general misconceptions that I have heard from people uh, really not working in tech. And also we have stolen or lost device issues. So basically, uh, if you lose your device, an attacker is gonna be able to authenticate to a website using your device. I think that if an attacker steals your, your phone and they are able to bypass your biometric authentication, uh, you probably have bigger things to worry about than they being able to log into your Facebook account, for instance. And lastly, uh, this one is actually true. Uh, if you lose your device, you're gonna lose access to your account. So that this is why you must have uh, either a backup account, a backup device, or a way to uh, recover that account. So that's actually a valid concern. All right, so now let's talk about real vulnerabilities in passwordless implementations, finally. All right, so uh, this is the first issue and I on purpose didn't provide the title because I didn't wanna give away the, all the fun in the beginning. So uh, this is uh, directly from the web authent documentation so if you go to that website, you're gonna see that uh, basically you need, uh, you need to provide a user object. Uh, essentially that user object has a name, a display name, and an ID. This is required for any, uh, whenever you're trying to authenticate or whenever you're trying to add a new authenticator to an account. Uh, just give me one second. Oops, sorry. Oops. Excuse me, just give me one second. There we go. Sorry about that. All right. So yeah, so uh, I was saying that you need to provide a user object when you are adding a new uh, device. This is expected because you need to map that specific uh, device to a user, right? So this is all in the uh, documentation for web authent. And then I went ahead and looked for some examples of those specific uh, implementations. Uh, the first one is from uh, our friends at Jubico. Essentially, no, I mean Duo Security. Uh, and uh, you can find the same. They are saying that you need to provide a user object and that user object contains an ID, a name, and a display name. Uh, this is directly from the documentation. Again, this is expected. Uh, this is the way that the web often works. Uh, one more example. Uh, this, we can find the same thing. Uh, you need to provide a user object. It has an ID, a name, and a display name. Uh, this is JavaScript code, by the way. This is the web authent API. Uh, lastly, I went for uh, the Yubico documentation. In order to add a new uh, YubiKey, you have to do the same because YubiKeys are also a FIDO2 credential and are also using web authent. So you need to provide a name, 
a display name and an ID. All right, so that's part of the expe of the expected data that web button is, is expecting, right? Uh, also for pass keys, uh, as I mentioned, pass keys are also a FIDO2 credential. Pass keys are also uh, using web authent, so you also have to pro provide an ID, a name, and a display name. With all that being said, uh, this is a real implementation of a password solution. Um, for you, uh, for those of you who are doing pen tests, you know that this is Burp. This is basically uh, an HTTP intercepting proxy. It's allowing us to tamper with all of the data that is the browser is sending to the server. Uh, if you take a closer look, uh, you can see that the application is sending a username and a display name as part of the specification. Uh, quick question here for my pen tester friends. What do you think it could happen if we try to tamper uh, that username to another email? Let's say the CEO's email. Any guesses? No? Well, uh, the specification doesn't actually say it, but uh, in this particular specification, if I tamper with that value, instead of uh, adding a new device to my account, I was able to add a device to a different account. So essentially, by doing this, uh, you could essentially take over any account in the company that you wanted. Just by adding a new device, you could impersonate any user in the system. And remember that we are doing passwords here, so we don't have any other way to authenticate. Uh, simply by sending this request, uh, you can actually take over any account that you like. This actually has CBE. Uh, you can go ahead and look for more details. Uh, but let, let's talk about it. All right. So. This application was, you know, was following the specification to the letter. It was doing everything that the, the documentation says. Uh, there wasn't any anything wrong with it. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that the documentation doesn't say that you don't have to trust this data. Uh, it may sound obvious to our security people, but it's, this is not obvious to the people who are implementing web authent. Uh, or at least, if it's documented, I couldn't find it. So. Uh, that actually makes me think, I mean, how many other applications are there that are just following the web button documentation and they are not providing that additional check? Um, essentially, uh, if you want it, uh, actually, if you like to remove that data from the request, it's not going to work because web button is expecting that data. So, uh, yeah, so it's, look, uh, it's leaving the developers to know, I mean, they, it's, they are on their own to implement this additional check because nobody's telling them that they have to do this. Right, so uh, this actually is for me. I, I should reach out to the FIDO Alliance and ask them, hey, why are you not uh, pointing this out? Why are you not documenting this? Or if you are, where is it? Because it's not obvious and nobody, I mean, at least this implementation was not doing it. All right, uh, moving on to magic links. If you remember, magic links are simply just a way to users to authenticate, right? Uh, they receive a link, they click it, they are in. This is a way to implement passwordless. Uh, but one thing I like to mention is that web applications are usually uh, just as vulnerable as they are flexible. And what I mean by that is that you can do pretty much anything that you want with uh, web applications. If you want to read a username from the headers, you can do that. If you want to read a username from the cookies, you can do it. I'm not saying that you should, but you could. Uh, so this is a problem with uh, because you are letting your developers do whatever they want, right? So this is a simplified example. Uh, this application had a, a way to authenticate users uh, using a link, something like this. Essentially, they, the application was providing a token, the user click it, and they are in. However, this particular application had two different user roles, one for users, one for admins. They were both able to authenticate using a, a magic link. Uh, however, uh, we can do some forced browsing. Uh, and for instance, if we try, this is an example, of course, but if we add the word admin, the token for the user was good for the admin. And uh, let's say that you got a token as a user, you simply change the link to and add the word admin, and you become an admin. Just like that. This also has a CBE. Uh, you can go ahead and look for it if you want more details. So let's talk about this. The token that the application was using was actually quite secure. I mean, uh, it was using uh, good cryptography. It was really long. I mean, uh, it was being created using secure functions. Uh, the token was expiring as soon as you click it. And even if you didn't click it, the token uh, was being expired after some time. So the magic implementation was didn't have any flaws, apparently. But uh, as you know, developers need to be sure to uh, 
protect every single endpoint. They need to be able to uh, verify every single input field, and attackers only need to find one uh, endpoint that you missed. And uh, this is what happened here. All right, moving on to number three. Uh, this is actually another take account takeover uh, using parameter tampering. It's very similar to the previous one. And again, our web applications are very flexible. Uh, when we're dealing with uh, passwordless authentication, it's not one single request. For instance, when you are talking about the username and password, usually the username and the password are sent in a single request, right? So, and that's it. But this is not the case when we're talking about passwordless. Uh, usually needs several requests. Uh, you need to sign a challenge, then you need to sign it, then the application needs to verify it. Really, uh, it needs a lot of requests. And in this particular case, uh, the application was doing a lot of validations, but again, they missed just one. So the attacker was able to provide a valid authentication for the user, but authenticated as a different user instead. Uh, this also has a CVE, and you can go ahead and look at it if you need more details. All right, uh, let's, let's talk about one more. Uh, this one is about account creation. Uh, again, web applications are very flexible. You can do pretty much what you want with them. Uh, and this time, we were talking about a demo application. Uh, you know, companies sometimes provide demo applications so they can uh, teach their customers how to implement passwordless or how to implement anything else, right? Uh, in this case, this particular vendor was using a demo application, but uh, in the user creation flow, uh, the application was not checking whether the user existed or not. So essentially what happened is that you went to the login page, uh, you tried to register, uh, you provide a username, and uh, the application wasn't checking if it existed or not, and essentially uh, since we're doing a FIDO authentication, you were adding a device to an account. So from a passwordless standpoint, it is the same as adding a, an authenticator to an existing account or to a new account because you are simply adding a new device, right? So what happened is what you were able to add new devices to any existing accounts, and uh, you were able to take over those accounts. Uh, again, this is a demo application, but still I think it's pretty, uh, pretty good to know that we should be doing all of these validations. And uh, lastly, the OWASP top 10. Uh, we have to remember that we are talking about web applications here, so we don't have to, we, we must not forget about doing the basic validations. Uh, that any other web application needs to happen, right? We have to do input validation, we need to do security checks in every single endpoint, and so forth and so on. All right, uh, so now let's talk about some recommendations. Uh, for developers, if you already have a secure SDLC, uh, I think it's, uh, it's really good that you, you have it. If you don't, uh, it, you should implement one. <laughs> what I mean by that is that you should, do, you should have some form of security testing in place, um, maybe some code scanning, uh, some dependency check, and all of those things that are very good to increase the security of your application. Also, you should do some testing, and then more testing, and then more testing. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mentioned this because all of the issues that we talk about they were found by humans. Uh, there is simply no way that a tool can find these issues. And if there is, uh, please let me know because I don't know of any tool that can do this. Uh, probably not even AI. So the best way to find these security vulnerabilities is by having testing done by humans. Also, uh, embrace testing for customers. Uh, a lot of times, companies don't want to be uh, allow their customers to do pen tests because they think they're going to find issues and you're going to have to fix them. That sometimes is true, but I mean, uh, I think that's best because you can find those issues before an adversary does, or before remote customers do, or before you have a leak. So uh, while it's true that this is gonna mean more work if you have issues, I think it's best to do it because otherwise, uh, it's best to fix it before uh, everybody knows, and uh, that way you're gonna prevent breaches and security incidents. For enterprises, uh, if you're thinking of implementing passwordless, uh, in, you are thinking about doing it uh, in-house versus a vendor. If you're thinking about using a vendor, uh, I think it's really important to hold those vendors accountable. Uh, you know, it's important to realize, I mean, how many times are they getting testing? I mean, are they just doing one pen test a year for compliance? Are they doing uh, multiple rounds of testing? Uh, you know, do they have a bug bounty program? Do they, uh, are they testing new features? 
do they have a public CBE program? So I think this, these questions can actually uh, make it apparent if that company is actually uh, doing something about security or even maybe they don't even have a security program. So uh, yeah, this is for all the enterprises. For pen testers, uh, yeah, actually when I was first uh, testing a password solution, I was kind of intimidated by it. I was thinking, well, this is using public key cryptography, right? I'm not a cryptography. I'm not gonna be able to find any issues here, right? Well, no, the truth is that uh, at the end of the day, these are just web applications. Uh, they have the same issues as any other web application. Uh, my personal recommendation for any pen tester uh, is gonna be just go for parameter tampering. This is where you're gonna find the most issues uh, and also unauthenticated APIs. So yeah, all of the issues that we talked about before, uh, they are related to web applications. So basically, all the same things that you're doing um, are gonna work in a passwordless application. And my recommendation would be not to spend too much time on trying to break the cryptography. Uh, I mean, if you can, go for it. But uh, it's probably gonna be uh, a lot of time and you're not gonna get any results there. For users, uh, actually embrace the future. I mean, uh, I talk about how passwordless can be, uh, can have issues, but uh, actually it's way more secure. Uh, Whenever you are presented with the option to use passwordless, uh, you should do it. I mean, I think uh, I think that passwords have way more issues than passwordless. And uh, as you can see here, uh, whenever an issue is found, it's quickly fixed. So you know, passwordless is a it's a very secure option. All right. So I think I went really really fast because uh, that's it. Uh, so. <laughs> That means we have a lot of time for questions if you have them. Uh, if not, uh, thanks a lot for being here and thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. Aldo, in the example you gave of adding a device, is there a way that we as the user can protect it? What do we do? Uh, not really. Uh, the question was if uh, you as users can protect yourselves against somebody else adding an, a device. Uh, really, there is no way you can do that. Uh, the application is the one that has to be providing that additional check uh, to make sure that the user who is adding that the, uh, the device is the one that owns that account. So really, as users, we don't have any defense. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any recommended patterns? Oh, oh, there you go. Do you have any recommended patterns for account recovery? Uh, well, we find, I guess, when we see most of the implementations we see leave old school methods in place for account recovery. So it'll be like you still have a password if you need to recover your account, or use TOTP or something like that, or use a phone number. And we find that most vendors aren't fully disabling legacy security in favor of passwordless. So I'm wondering if you have any fully passwordless uh, account recovery mechanisms. Sure. Uh, well, this is not a blog. I mean, this is, well, we do have a, in my vendor, we do have a way to do that. So essentially what it does is that we are providing a way to verify the identity of the user. Essentially, uh, we have a specific website that you can go. You type your username and then we do an identity verification. Uh, right now we're using it by using uh, essentially, it's like a meeting. I mean, I can, I can, des I can describe it better uh, by showing a demo, but essentially we do have a way to do this. Uh, it verifies your identity, it connects you with your manager, and uh, basically it can do face verification or phone verification, that's up to the, to the manager. And once they have verified that you are the person who owns that account, they send you a uh, a magic link, and you can add a new device. Okay. No more questions? No? All right. All right, well, thanks for being here. Uh, feel free to, uh, I didn't have a Twitter, but feel free to add me on LinkedIn if you like. Uh, feel free to uh, reach out to me if you have any more questions, and thanks again for being here. Thank you.